Mr. Prime Minister Mohammad Shataya, thank you so much for joining VOA today. Thank you for having me. So President Biden came to the West Bank. He came with sympathetic words, an offer to renew ties with the Palestinians, and renewed support for the two-state solution. Do you believe that he is genuine? I mean, by all means, he said he believed in two states and he conveyed this to Golda Meir in his first visit to the region in 1973. And he is a true believer, that's what he said. And I think he does, he does believe in two states. The issue for us is not what do you believe in. The question is that there is a systematic destruction of two states and the most serious enemy of two states is settlements. These are complaints that we have heard very often from the Palestinians. On the other hand, the Israelis and also the Americans believe that there is not a united partner from the Palestinians to achieve settlement. Uh, you have had a split government since 2006. You have not had elections since 2006. So what can you say, what can you uh, convince people around the world and also the Palestinians to say that you do have the mandate to reach a two-state solution? Well, look, what about a situation that was before 2006? Palestinians were united and nothing has happened. On the contrary, it's because nothing has happened, we lost the elections in 2006. So the situation has to be re reversed in a way. I just want to go back again to President Joe Biden's visit. So President Joe Biden, since last year, has resumed assistance to the Palestinian people that President Donald Trump cut. Uh, however, he has also continued some of President Trump's policies, including not reopening the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem. He did not criticize Israeli settlement while he was in the region. In your view, how does Joe Biden compare to Donald Trump? Uncomparable. I mean, by all means, we were not talking to the uh, Trump administration. And now we are relinking and we're reconnecting and we are talking to the Biden administration at every level. When it comes to the assistance also, it is important that Washington has announced assistance to the Palestinian people. I mean, uh, helping Anarwa is important, East Jerusalem hospitals and so on. But again, what we need is official assistance to come to the state of Palestine, to come to the, to the Palestinian government. Now Europe has resumed its aid to us. We are hoping that Washington will resume direct aid to us, which has not, this aid that has been announced is not direct with us, but of course our people will benefit from it at the end of the day and it will uh, create some sort of economic uh, uh, improvement on the ground. We just met some of your people though, when you're speaking about assistance, when you're speaking about um, financial aid, we just met some of young Palestinians today and one of them told us that he is very frustrated with the Palestinian Authority, the level of corruption and the level of the lack of good gov governance. And he doesn't believe that you, the Palestinian Authority, can facilitate um, his aspirations towards a life of freedom and a life of prosperity. What would you say to those people? Well, look, I mean, we are fighting corruption at every level. This is something that no one can tolerate one second. I understand the frustration. The frustration is, has to do with quite a number of issues. One, there is no political progress. This man that you are talking about, he needs to see tomorrow. He needs a better tomorrow. Look, I mean, if you want to go to Jerusalem, you need a permit. If you want to go to Gaza, you need a permit. If you want, to, if you want a job, you need to, go to, to get a permit. If you need to establish any economic facility, you need a permit from the Israelis. The U.S. right now is very much focused on the war in Ukraine. And as part of that focus, President Biden is really trying to shore up alliances all around the world, including the growing alliance, the growing friendship between Arab nations and Israel to counter Iran. So I wanted to get your take on what your thoughts are on this warming relations in terms of how it might impact the Palestinian cause towards a two-state solution. Well, look, <clears throat> Jordan has normalized relations with Israel <clears throat> immediately after Israel withdrew from occupied Jordanian territory. Egypt has normalized relations with Israel after Israel has withdrawn from Egyptian occupied territory, which is Sinai. So for us, the common factor between all Arab countries was the Arab Peace Initiative. 
The Arab Peace Initiative was designed on the basis of the following. <coughs> Arabs will normalize relations with Israel on the assumption that Israel will end its occupation to the Arab and Palestinian occupied territory. This is something that has not happened. And therefore, for us, <coughs> we are committed to the Arab Peace Initiative because that did enjoy an Arab consensus. Mm -hmm. And that is where a situation in which <coughs> there has been a violation of that. Now, for us, what we need is Arab coordination, whatever it is and whatever the direction is. We are supposed to go to war together or we are supposed to go to peace together. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned that the Saudis might normalize relations with Israel? No, I don't think. I mean, the Saudi position is very clear. The Prince Mohammed bin Salman was very clear and the Minister of Foreign Affairs was extremely clear in, in more than one occasion. Saudis will not normalize with Israel unless Israel end its occupation to the Palestinian territory. You believe that wholeheartedly? I do, of course. I think the Saudis are very genuine about that. And I think what we hear from them is important. And I think what was said at the Jeddah summit in the presence of President Biden was very important. I mean, all Arab speakers, they stress the centrality of the Palestine question and that peace is a crucial issue in the region only if the question of Palestine is settled. But we have seen that narrative or that principle be challenged with the Abraham Accords, with UAE and Bahrain recognizing Israel even without any kind of progress. But also United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, they also said in their speeches and every day, they said that Palestine is a crucial issue and Al-Aqsa Mosque is a central issue of the conflict and that two-state solution is the only solution. I mean, all Arabs, they believe in that. For us, as I said, the most important issue is a commitment to the Arab Peace Initiative. We are committed to that. And I, unfortunately, it is Israel that is rejecting the Arab Peace Initiative. It is the Israelis who didn't buy it even when it was issued in 2002. This was years ago. I mean, 20 years ago now, uh, after the Arab Peace Initiative, and the Arabs were genuine when they presented it that they wanted peace in the region on the basis of land for peace formula. There is also a growing security partnership, though, between Arab nations and Israel to counter the threat of Iran. Would the Palestinian Authority join that coalition? Would you be able to explain it to the Palestinian people? There is no coalition. <clears throat> we all know. We heard the statements yesterday and a few days ago in Jeddah that the Iranian issue needs a political solution. And I think that Washington is negotiating, Europe is negotiating with the Iranians. There was an agreement with Iran. And I think the Saudis also are talking to the Iranians. Everybody is. United Arab Emirates has announced explicitly and clearly that they are not going to be part of any coalition against Iran and so on. So the issue for us is not about coalitions or polarization of the region. The issue is that we need peaceful region. And in order for us to have peaceful region, everybody has a right to be sovereign within their own borders including the Palestinians. To dig deeper into that issue, there may not be a formal security, you know, Middle East NATO type of coalition, but there is growing partnership and there is growing co cooperation, for example, in this air and missile defense system that the U.S. is trying to encourage Arab nations and Israelis to build together. How does the Palestinian Authority feel about that? Look, I mean, <clears throat> We don't like to see a militarization of the region. <clears throat> we would like to see a demilitarization of the region. <clears throat> this uh, build up of arms, it doesn't take us anywhere. The region is already bleeding. You know, Yemen, <clears throat> Syria, Iraq, most of the region is bleeding. You don't need to build uh, capacity, military capacity in the region. The region needs peaceful solution. The region needs economic development. And in order for us to go into that direction, I think investments should go into that direction. It's a pity that billions of dollars are spent on arms. If these billions of dollars are spent in poor countries, we could have avoided <coughs> a failing state in Yemen or a situation in Syria or in Iraq and so on and so forth. That is what the region needs. It needs economic development, hope for the future, the young generation, 
and also prosperity because without that, based on peace, the most important part of the story is that we have not seen the fruits of peace. We have not seen the peace process in ending in a successful yeah. product and, 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 and that begins with political dialogue and I understand that uh, President Mahmoud Abbas has just recently spoken to Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid as well as uh, Hamas leadership. This has been the first time that it's happened in several years. Do you think that this opening can lead to something more constructive and more permanent? Well, I mean, the president in his press conference in the presence, in the presence of President Biden, he was explicit. He said, I extend my hand to the Israelis. Let's sit down together and solve it. We are ready for that. Is that realistic? It's very realistic because our president was a real champion for the whole of the peace process. And he believes in it genuinely. And I think we all do. We all do, simply because we know that a successful peace negotiation, it is in the benefit of the Palestinians. We are the ones who are under occupation. It's not our tanks that is surrounding Tel Aviv. It's the Israeli tanks that's occupying Ramallah and, and all other parts of Palestine, including Jerusalem. So for us, I mean, we are also realistic. We are very realistic people. We know that there is no government in Israel. But even when there was a government in Israel, remember what Bennett was saying, three no's. No to talks with to President Abbas, no negotiations with the Palestinians, and no to toast the solution. When you, have, when you don't have a partner in Israel, with whom shall we talk? Well, we heard Prime Minister Lapid confirmed his support for the two-state solution. I want to just go back again to what you mentioned, because I think this is important on the case of Shireen Abu Akleh. Do you believe the conclusion of U.S. investigators that the bullet came, it was likely an Israeli bullet, but they had no reason to believe that it was intentional. Well, look, first of all, there is no way that you can say it is intentional or not intentional before you ask the soldier who shot, who, who, who took the shots. The soldier has never been asked. So if the conclusion that it was from the side of the Israeli army, then somebody should have asked the soldier. It's why do you, how is it possible for you to draw a conclusion that it is intentional or unintentional without asking the person or without asking the, the commander who was in the region? So I don't buy this argument at all or this conclusion at all. Shirin Abu Akli was killed by the Israelis. Do you Paul believe Saul. that the US is shielding the Israelis from taking full responsibility? Well, I know that there was a technical report, a security report, but what was issued was a political report. And I know that there is a gap between a technical report and a political report. And I think the political report did uh, stand short on reality. You cannot say that it is unintentional without asking the soldier who actually, you know, uh, took the shot. So my last question is, um for our viewers, our VOA viewers around the world who are Muslims or they live in Muslim-majority countries. As I mentioned, I grew up in Indonesia, so I'm very familiar with the Palestinian cause. However, I think there's a tendency for people to look at this conflict in a very black and white way, in a religious context between Muslims and Jews. Do you believe that kind of view is actually constructive to the Palestinian cause? And what would be your message to them? No. The conflict in Palestine is not religious. The conflict in Palestine is political because we stood against all occupations that occupied Palestine all along history. It has nothing to do with religion. We stood solid against Iraqi occupation to Kuwait. That's an Arab Muslim Sunni country occupying another Arab Muslim Sunni country. So the issue is not about religion. The issue is about occupation. My message through you is that we are people who want to see peace prevailing in our region. We are people who care about the dignity of our kids and, and, and men and women and so on. We are people who are looking for a better tomorrow. And we are people who are only asking for an independent, sovereign, contiguous state on the borders of 67, which is only 22% of what used to be called Palestine. I'm hopeful that tomorrow will be much better. Prime Minister Stay, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well done, shukran. Okay.